can't is a very powerful word. It's very powerful indeed, because uh, for some people it infers impossible. I'd like to talk to you today about the perception of impossible, because we really can't talk about what can or can't be done in this world unless we talk about the perception of impossible. You know, when you're little, you have this incredible ability to believe that anything in this world is possible. Because you, as an uncarved block, are not yet bound and strictured by the limitations that the word can't is going to put into your life later on. So a box is a fabulous spaceship, and you're orbiting the rings of Saturn, and that broom you just straddled can be a unicorn, or it can be your trusty steed as you're riding out with your posse in the Old West to capture the bad guys. And your two dogs dragging you around the backyard on your plastic sled in the snow are no such thing. They are, in fact, your trusty sled dogs who have just pulled you across the finish line at the Iditarod because you won. I love the imagination of children. When I was a child, I thought I could stop the waves. I was inutterably convinced of that, and to be honest with you, I'm still on my bucket list. I think somewhere down the road I will. I grew up on Lewis Beach, so the waves were prominent. Uh, my sister had an album cover. It had it, uh, Elton John's lyricist, Bernie Taupin, inside. And there was a photograph of him out on the beach like this. And the waves were heeding his command, and they were frozen perfectly still. And I used to take myself out onto Lewis Beach, and I would muster up all the magic I had inside of myself, and I would do the same thing. But I couldn't stop the waves. I just figured I hadn't really mustered up enough magic to do it yet. But you see, that's where perception comes into play. Because I could have been utterly defeated by that and thought, I will never stop the waves. But the way I saw it at eight and the way I still see it today is I think I can because I have a picture of a guy doing it and I'm going to hang on to that. Uh, in uh, 1993, I opened Nassau Valley Vineyards, indeed the state's first winery, and I had to change law to do so, as Leanne said. None of those things were easy. Um, but you know, all along the way, all I heard from everyone was can't. It can't be done. You can't do it. But the reality was, no one had ever tried. So how could anyone say it couldn't be done? You know, we were raised farmers' children, actually, and uh, my, my father raised a lot of alfalfa hay and had beef cattle, so we were actually forced labor as children. That's the only reason they bothered to have any of us. Any of you people who grew up on a farm know what I'm saying is true. Uh, the day we turned 10, we got to go to work. That was my father's gift to all of us. And we went to that hayfield quite literally from dawn to dusk. And if you argued about it, the man always had some snappy rejoinder like, yeah, I made one of you, I can make your replacement pretty quick, and I guarantee they'll have a better attitude than yours. Just... <laughs> aye, aye, Skip. Well, needless to say, folks, with an upbringing like that, I wanted nothing to do with agriculture again in the rest of my natural-born life, and I ran screaming from the room off to the big city. But I needed a job. And when I was in college, I ended up going to work for Les Amis Duvin International, which was the world's largest consumer wine education organization. We also, we also had their sister publication, The Friends of Wine magazine. Um, when I went to work for them, I started as an editorial assistant. I was doing photography. But as I further learned the wine trade, I ended up eventually being a contributing writer for that publication. And I have to tell you, I'm, I'm the first to say, I got an unusual education in the wine business and one that was truly blessed. I was privileged to learn the wine industry and grape growing and the principles of good winemaking from some of the most important people in the business. So again, I felt very privileged about that. I also had the background of having been forced labor in the fields of Sussex County for 10 years. So when I came back to Delaware and I noticed that we had no wineries here, I felt fairly well versed at that point to be able to say that made no sense. And in the late 80s, I moved back, and my father and I began the adventure of starting Nassau Valley Vineyards. But again, at every turn, what I heard was, can't. It can't be done. We'd put grapes in the ground, and they were growing, yet people were still saying, it can't be done. When I would say to them, 
why do you say it can't be done? Nobody ever had a logical response. Nobody ever had uh, any kind of response to that that made sense whatsoever. They would just simply look at me and say, well, just because it can't. And I would say, well, okay, have you tried and failed? Well, that was shocking. They had no response at all. And so I would ask the question again, have you tried and failed? And in great frustration, they would just say, well, no, but that's not the point. That's not the point. You see, they perceived that it was impossible. They perceived that it, it couldn't be done. You know, a very wise person once told me that for any idea to, to come to fruition, for, uh, for, for any mission that you're on to ultimately be successful, uh, for, for any venture in life to take off, if you're really going to do it right, there are three things you must do. The first one is do the research. You can't go in cold. You must know everything there is to know about what it is you're getting ready to attempt to do. You have to know what the possibilities are. You have to know the challenges. You have to know uh, where you might be prone to failure. And you have to figure out what you're going to do about every single one of those things. The second is you have to know the science. That is, you have to understand everything in the mechanics of this thing you want to do. Whether that is physical science, say biology or chemistry uh, or physics itself, or if it's more esoteric, like the philosophy behind why you're doing something, or the psychology behind it. And the third thing is, you have to own the labor. You cannot ride the back of someone else's success and claim that as your own. And when I say own the labor, that is everything from literally the physical labor, uh, the, the sweat equity, to the intellectual property. It's about whatever labor you put into it, and that's all the labor, physical labor, mental labor. The point is it has to be yours. You have to own that. You can never assess the weight of the bucket if you've paid somebody to carry the water for you, can you? So when you look at what we were trying to achieve, I'd done all of these things. I had done the research, I knew the science, I was certainly owning the labor, and yet still, at every turn, people said, it can't be done. Well, they hadn't done the research, they didn't know the science, they weren't doing any labor, yet at every turn, again, they were inutterably convinced I was bound for failure. Now, when you add on top of that that I still had to get a law changed to make wine in Delaware, well, then they were certain I was nothing less than a lunatic. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, you know, people have these misconceptions and they're so debilitating to us in this, in this life. It's, it's very hard. Uh, and, and it takes us a long time to get past a lot of those misconceptions and those notions that we have. The long and the short of what happened through all of this, guys, I'll, I'll, I'll boil down very quickly so I can get on to my next point. People said I would never change Delaware law. We were in and out with the governor's signature in less than 45 days. People said, I would never grow grapes and make wine in Delaware. We just celebrated our 22nd anniversary and we have surpassed 400 medals in international competition. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I opened the first winery on the entire peninsula and now there are dozens. And I hope all of my efforts gave those people at least one gift. I hope it took can't out of their vocabulary. I hope that in, in laying that groundwork, when somebody said to them, you can't do this, they said, yes, I can. Nassau Valley Vineyards has already done it. I hope I took can't out of their vocabulary. There's a very important thing I learned in this journey, and that is this, that success is locked in the prison of perception. Only once it has been freed can it be achieved. I also learned that people are so bound up in their own insecurity and in their own lack of self-worth, they are ready to saddle the person next to them with their inabilities in a heartbeat. People are ready to reach out in their own insecurity and lay it on you. Why is that? Think about how many times, though, you've done it to yourself. Think about how many times you've told yourself you can't do something when, in fact, you've never even tried. Take that one step further and think about the knee-jerk reaction you have when you do that to your spouse or your children or your coworker. When you just summarily look at them and say, you can't do that. Well, how do you know what they can do? They've never even tried. 
what has prompted you to suddenly show up like the guy at the balloon convention with a pin? Fear? Lack of your own self-worthiness? Jealousy? Sometimes maybe it's a combination of all of those things. But it's something that we have to get past, right? You know, along my journey, fear jumped in and, and really almost sucked me out to sea with it a couple of times. There's a story I'm going to share with you today that I've kept very closely guarded for 25 years, but this is what we're talking about, so I'm going to give it to you anyway. The very first day I went to Legislative Hall to work my bill, I drove around the building all day long. I never once walked through the door. I was utterly terrified. People who know me know I am afraid of nothing. And that day, fear owned me. I rode around the building all day long. A couple of times I stopped thinking, this is, I, I, I'm just, I gotta do this, I'm gonna go inside. And then I was crippled with hearing all of those people who said, you can't do this. You can't do this. And as I drove back to Lewis from Dover, I was utterly ashamed of myself. And I just kept saying to myself over and over again, oh my gosh, these people are right. I can't do this. I can't do this. And then all of a sudden, I heard the words of one of my most favorite people in the world, a great teacher and mentor of mine, Jay Quinn. Anytime I ever said, I can't, to Jay, his lightning fast response was, can't lives on won't street. <laughs> True. I went to a boarding school called uh, Mercersburg Academy for high school. That's where I knew Jay. Uh, and in the dressing room in the theater, above the makeup mirrors, was a big giant sign that was another very famous quote of Jay's. And it was this. Of course it's difficult. If it were easy, there'd be more people here, and then where would we be? Very famous words. And I thought about that, too. You know, uh, I, I came across this quote that said, a negative mind will never allow for a positive life. In that one moment, I was letting my negative mind roll all over anything positive that was going to be ahead of me. And I just had to snap out of it. And armed with Jay's words, I thought, you're right. Of course it's difficult, but it's not impossible. And the next day, I went back to Legislative Hall, and I walked through those doors. Was I scared? Well, of course I was. Was I incapacitated? No way. And you know, I walked in, and the lobbyist said, who are you lobbying for, kid? And I said, myself. And they all went, oh, yourself? You can't do that. You have to hire one of us to do that. Again, with the word can't. <laughs> well, you know what I knew in that moment? There would never be enough money in the world I could pay those people to explain my story and tell people what was in my heart. Never. So you have to own your story, ladies and gentlemen. When, when you have fear about what you're capable of or what you're not capable of, you have to remember what's inside of you and how much you want it, and how much you, you need to own it and earn it. It's, uh, it. You know, it's a pretty remarkable thing. Think about how powerful the negative animus of the word can't really is. It actually goes back to those early days of imagination and make-believe. Now you're in school, and suddenly people say, well, you can't orbit the rings of Saturn. You're a girl, and girls don't make good astronauts. There are no such things as unicorns, and you're not chasing after, or you're not in a posse chasing after some bad guy. And you'll never be an Olympic sprinter because you're clumsy and you need to fall down when you walk. And for God's sakes, you can't win the Iditarod. You live in South Florida, and you've never even seen snow. Can't, 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 can't. Well, another thing I've learned is that when you tell somebody something long enough, after a while, a lot of people are prone to simply believe it. And if people are bound by the inability they feel they have, they will never dare to try anything. Ladies and gentlemen, think about what our lives would be like if all of those really bold people never dared to do things that have given us all kinds of magical, magical things in this world, right? It's all about perception, again. Perception is really a, a, an incredibly huge thing. Um, my perception changed on so many different levels uh, because I, I, had to, I had to have it change. That was the only thing that was going to move me forward. Perception is things like a lifelong city dweller can show up at my vineyard and see a, a, an insect and say, oh my gosh, you have to kill that. But I see the same insect and I know that I don't have to spray poison 
because that bug is in the vineyard eating 10 other bugs that are detrimental to the vines or to my flower beds. You know, again, it's, it's perception. And perception changes when your perspective on things change, and that comes with experience. Can I move a 2,000-pound boulder out of the middle of my path? No. I am physically incapable of picking it up and moving it. Can I break it apart into smaller pieces, take it away piece by piece until I can finally move it and I can pass? Absolutely, I can do that. That's a perception. That's my perspective. That's how I choose to see my life now. Uh, I will share this thought with you. Impossible. That's a pretty daunting, powerful word, isn't it? Impossible. You can't do something. But if you change the perspective, you can make it a powerful affirmation. I'm possible. You're possible. Anything's possible, right? It's all about how you see it. Today, this conference celebrates pioneers and innovators. If you think about all of those people out there that could have been hindered by the word can't, the great minds of medicine, math, science, engineering, the arts, and so on and so on and so on, we would have a pretty dull world, wouldn't we? Well, I can't imagine life without them. Can you? Thank you very much. Thank you.